<clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Half of what I was going to say, uh, the positions of each of the speakers you mentioned already. This is one of the most expected panels for us, Argentinians. Uh, the Money and Banking Conference are developed to learn from others. And on this occasion, we need to learn from our neighbors. We have central bank governors from Paraguay and Peru, Carlos Vegg, chief economist in the World Bank for Latin America, and he's from Uruguay, so he's also a neighbor. <coughs> and of course, what we are most interested about these four countries is to see who of the four will be part of the World Cup, the Soccer World Cup. It's difficult for all four of us to be there because Brazil is already there. But the, uh, the second most important thing to us is to see the experience as to how these countries reached very low inflation rates in the case of Peru and Paraguay, they are two of the most successful economies in South America. And Carlos Vegg is going to make the first presentation, and he will provide a more general overview of Latin America. The panel is yours. Thank you so much for being here and for helping us understand this big priority for us, how to lower our inflation rate. Carlos, the floor is yours. Can I please have my presentation? Thank you. I want to thank Governor Sturzenegger. And I'd like to thank Andy Mayer for the invitation to be here. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about a topic that we have studied for a long time, from 40 years, with people like Guillermo Calvo, Carmen Reinhardt, etc. It is a topic of interest. I thought it would be a good opportunity for us to take the time I have to think about the development of inflation in the region. This is my opinion. This is subject to interpretation, like any story. But I'm going to have a, a beginning, a, a core, and an ending, a conclusion that will be a happy ending. For me, the beginning of it all, if we, we should have to write a book about the history of inflation in the region, the key idea is chronic inflation. Before discussing this, let's remember it's important to have the story in your mind. Otherwise, you lose perspective. And when you lose perspective, you lose conceptual wealth and the ability to do things properly. We have had the history in the region since the 1940s we have had a long history of inflation in the region. It's not like other countries where inflation is under 3%, which is like having zero inflation. This starts in 1940. If we should identify a book, there were more books than papers written back then, and there's a Cuban economist 
to pay homage to Carmen, Felipe Passos. He wrote in 1972 a book that I recommend to anybody who enjoys reading economic history. It's an excellent book, very well written, very clear, with many insights. He wrote a book that he entitled Chronic Inflation. And that's a key point. That's a point that was almost a revolutionary conceptual point. Until that moment, people talked about, when we talked about hyperinflation, and even I wrote some articles about Kagan hyperinflations that had been studied by Kagan in 1952, <coughs> when there were new data or there had been adaptive expectations, etc. So we continue to think about the MANA, hyperinflation, the first, the second, Hungary, etc. That was the world of inflation that we studied. And Felipe Passos says, OK, fine with Kagan's inflations, hyperinflations. They are interesting as reading material to learn. But what I see in Latin America has nothing to do with Kagan's hyperinflations. What I see in Latin America is what we call chronic inflation to draw a distinction with hyperinflation. As you know, these were inflationary processes. And here you can see this table where you can see the main differences. Hyperinflation is defined. That's a definition, a complicated definition. But this, the necessary condition was for inflation to exceed 50% per month. So do your maths times 12, and what you get is 20,000. Instead, with chronic inflation, there wasn't a formal definition. Passos did not mention a figure. And he was right, because that changed. Inflation was higher than developed countries that had low inflation back then, and that it was persistent. Another characteristic of hyperinflation is it was measured in monthly terms. I cannot include all tables here, but German hyperinflation lasted 11 months. The Hungarian lasted 15 months. So hyperinflation was measured in months. Instead, chronic inflation could last years or even decades. The third difference was that hyperinflation was like having a, 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 something, a, a ball in a bedroom with zero gravity, so it would oscillate freely, and there was an acceleration in the past six months where the economy literally collapsed. <coughs> that was a failed state. As is said now, for other countries. 
Este, eh, eh, en cambio, una Instead, característica, una característica a la, característica de la inflación crónica es que quizás porque no sabían did not know any better, we're talking about the 50s or 60s, the reaction of many countries, such as Brazil, was to learn to coexist with chronic inflation, accept that they would have an inflation of 15 or 20 percent per month, they would index another issue. Countries adopted real exchange rate rules, so inflation went was five, and they adjusted the exchange rate, and the system no longer had a nominal anchor. That's a key concept now, but it wasn't back then. And then inflation was a bit lost, but what was important is that it perpetrated, and it didn't necessarily tend to accelerate. Though, as we will see in the next slide, when there was a shock, inflation would respond. For instance, if there was an exchange rule based on the real exchange rate, it would reach a new cap and inflation would remain there under that cap. Another key feature, and this is key, because here we are already talking about stabilization. The inflationary explosion in hyperinflation was such, we are talking about figures that are difficult to conceive. Have a look at Kagan's book. So much so that after six or eight months, prices and everything everything was denominated in dollars. The advantage there, it was a very bad situation, but in order to find an advantage, this has been so, and that is why <coughs> big hyperinflation stabilized with the exchange rate. If everything is denominated in dollars, they fix the dollar rate and inflation is over. And uh, they would completely eliminate the fiscal deficit so there was a clear strategy for stabilization in the exchange rate. It worked because everything was dollar denominated. <clears throat> Another important element that explains what came later is that the fiscal origin of hyperinflation was obvious. Deficits were 30, 40 percent of output, so even the enemies of the idea that deficit causes inflation could not deny that reality. Instead, with chronic inflation, although it is true that the source of inflation remains fiscal, it is more complicated to show because the monetary authority may take debt. There is no one-to-one -one correlation. And then the source, the fiscal source of chronic inflation is less obvious. Here, just to show you some examples, I'm going to be unfair with Argentina because I wrote 
official inflation, which we know wasn't true until one and a half years ago. But this is just to show how chronic uh, processes, inflation processes have lasted a lot. And when it stabilized, when they realized that they couldn't continue to target real exchange rates, when they realized they couldn't index all of the economy, we see dramatic drops in inflation. And now Chile, Paraguay, Peru, and Colombia, Uruguay is at 7, but all others are under 3%. And Argentina, in just one year, dropped its inflation by half from 40 to 20 percent, and it's the lowest inflation rate in the past seven years. <coughs> so inflation can be stabilized if the right tools are employed. This is inflation taking advantage that there aren't many Brazilians here. <laughs> We can say that when Brazil received oil shocks, it had a real exchange rate rule that accommodated the shock multiplied by two because it was always trying to catch up with an inflation that was growing. <coughs> Towards the end, have a look at 2013-2017. This is for 10 countries. I'm not choosing the five countries under 3% inflation. I'm choosing 10 countries. This is the average, the average is 5%. What are the main two? How was it that inflation was lowered? How did they think back then and still now? This is the way it is. There isn't much to invent here. <coughs> we could say that the key is to have a strong nominal anchor, which is exactly what economists did not have clear in their minds in the 60s and 70s. This is starting in the mid-70s, early 80s. <coughs> this idea became an important, a prevailing idea that we needed to have a serious nominal anchor. At that point, there were two ways. One was stabilization based on the exchange rates that would lower inflation and the real exchange rate. It's important to notice that real exchange rate in theory and in practice, appreciate with the exchange rate based stabilization as well as with monetary supply based stabilization. But the big difference is, and it's inevitable, when you reduce inflation, you will have recession. That's inevitable. There is empirical evidence about it. Theoretical studies for all countries are very clear in this regard. The new thing here for emerging markets, particularly for Latin America, was the following idea. As you can see in this chart, <coughs> 
There was a boom, an initial boom, caused by a drop in the real initial rate, and then GDP grew at the very beginning of the period four points or six points if you start two years earlier and later you have disinflation because the economy has to make an inflationary adjustment according to the real exchange rate and the same happened with consumption so initial boom and later bust which was alternative to this scenario money supply based stabilization the real exchange rate also appreciated see how inflation dropped but the key to this scenario is the chart you have seen before so here we have bust or recession at the very beginning because when you exert pressure on money supply, liquidity drops, and according to the real exchange rate, if it, this changes, there will be a hike causing the initial recession, but later on the economy may recover quickly. So we had a choice here known as recession now versus recession later. And the choice heavily depended on the overall ideas of those engaged in this scenario, regardless of the type of monetary policy put in place. Maybe there were people eager to pay initial costs and then enjoy from the recovery. Here, taking into account the two former slides, you may cover several stabilization plans in order to understand what happened. Here I have plotted the last 20 years, where you can see the last phase where fiscal deficit has always been a major player in this scenario. Here you can see inflation starting at 16, reaching then 3 with a phased reduction in fiscal deficit, unlike hyperinflation, where fiscal deficit dropped instantaneously, this has never been done in stabilizations originated in chronic inflation because the experience showed that they did not work. It was better to make fiscal adjustments on a gradual basis. And now, Let's close this cycle. I open up the cycle with this idea of step-by-step -step process, and now I'm going to close the cycle by using money supply and or rate of exchange and show you the differences between these two components. This is a much more modern phenomenon. It has been happening over the last 20 years. And I think that this is a wonderful way of closing this chair with three legs. Inflation targeting regimes. Here we have several questions to ask. I will give you my opinion. 
Number one, causality, questions about causality. Many papers have been written on causality. When inflation is fairly low and you want to go from 10 to 3 percent, is inflation targeting the cause for the last push in the drop in inflation, or is it a low inflation which leads to an inflation targeting regime. This is a sort of seal of approval hypothesis, a prize that the market is given to the best central banker. In my opinion, the answer to this question is still being discussed, empirical evidence show that concerning causality, as well as the different experiences, are laying emphasis on cause-effect on both directions, and inflation-targeting regime helps complete this elimination because Imagine that the title of our session is the conquest of inflation in the region, and I have taken it very seriously. Again, there is empirical evidence on the fact that, that the inflationary, the inflation targeted regime helps offering a nominal anchor because if the uh, model is uh, reliable and credible, pi bar, chart, as Mr. Calvo mentioned the other day when he said an inflation targeting regime has no nominal anchor. I disagree with him. If inflation targeting is credible and reliable, and we could write many papers on this topic, that credible inflation target is the nominal anchor for the monetary system. And number two, causality, once we have reached a 3% inflation rate, if we have an inflation targeting system in place, Inflation targeting may provide the necessary credibility and reliability as a nominal anchor, I mean to anchor inflationary expectations consistently with what the central bank has fixed as an inflation target, which consolidates the last round of this inflationary trip. And this is how I view this cycle in three stages or phases. And in concluding, this is the last slide with the appropriate stabilization policies, the region has managed to reduce inflation at 5.5 percent levels, that is to say levels that are lower than one digit. And this is very important indeed. I think that the whole region will be able to attain this goal. We have conquered inflation. Conclusion number two, a low inflation level, as Federico mentioned at the beginning of this seminar, is a very important social component because you know that inflation taxes regressive, and if inflation is low, we have uh, empirical evidence in place concerning transition economies and other economies whereby a low level of inflation is a prerequisite for stable and sustainable growth. Conclusion number three, the use of a nominal anchor, a strong nominal anchor, is a key element. And this is the major conceptual contribution from the 1970s and 1980s. And finally, an inflation targeting regime 
serves a twofold purpose. On the one hand, it helps complete the disinflation process, and when this process has been completed, we have a stable, credible, and sustainable inflation target, which is the basis for any sustainable monetary system with a very low inflation rate. Thank you very much. Let's now share Carlos Valdovino's presentation, Central Bank of Paraguay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank the Central Bank of Argentina for having organized this wonderful seminar. Thank you so much for the invitation and the outstanding organization. Even though in the future we're going to have a liquidity problem in my household finances because my wife is here with me. I'll, I was thinking of starting my presentation talking about soccer, but well, taking into account what happened with Paraguay, I have really changed my idea. In uh, the World Cup in South Africa, we got together and said, what are we going to do? And when we said, well, we're going to put in place inflation targeting regimes. This is the presentation that I have prepared about the history of Paraguay concerning the conquest of inflation and implementing inflation targeting regimes, which is very interesting to you all, and I hope that it will be so. As this is being transmitted through streaming, I will start by the conclusion. And we cannot build, we cannot plan. And we cannot even dream of having an economy growing on a sustainable basis and on an inclusive basis without having sound macroeconomic foundations. And one of the pillars to those foundations is low inflation, stable and predictable inflation. Those who say otherwise are not saying something that is consistent with reality, something that is not possible to do, and mainly this is not serious. Let's see the Paraguayan experience, and let me make a brief historical review. This is Latin America over the last hyperinflation periods in our countries. See the number of zeros that have been taken away from our currencies. We have to bear this chart in mind because it's very easy to forget about the positive outcomes of the conquest of inflation. Now we have improved substantially vis-a-vis -vis the 1980s and 1990s, but we are still having differences among our countries. We have to change axis because today we are no longer one single country south of the northern part. We are still having differences between different countries, 3% and some other countries, a higher figure, but we no longer have three-digit inflation, even though many countries have much room for improvement. We are very proud of this diagram, even though we always argue with Julio about these figures. But here you see 
how old the different currencies in the region are. It's very difficult to set a specific date for the birth of these countries. But in the case of Paraguay, we have an executive order saying that we have been having the same currency for 74 years without taking away zeros, without shifting to another currency. We are very proud of it, and we were lucky enough and coherent enough in the course of time to avoid being tempted to monetize all fiscal deficits. Not only our monetary policy has been conservative, but the whole Paraguayan society is also conservative in this regard. Here you can see the history of Paraguayan inflation in 1990, a peak, 44%. Therefore, the Paraguayan society is not much tolerant of high levels of inflation, as it happened in many other countries in Latin America. To your right, historically speaking, we have had one of the lowest inflation rates in Latin America, so we have succeeded in conquering and curbing inflation. Our history has been a history of stability in Paraguay, but there is always room for improvement and improving the monetary policy goes hand in hand with the latest developments. This has been taken from the September 22nd newspaper, September 22nd in the year 1960. Here you can read monetary stability, gaining consensus on different criteria, the Guarani currency, 70 years of stability. Stability, monetary stability has been of the essence for us. And to your right, the cover of a book, the Warani, 70 years of stability. This has been a conquest really made by the Paraguayan society at large. This is what we do and what we should keep on doing. And uh, as uh, we wanted to implement inflation targeting, we did so after the year 2011. This process cannot be conducted overnight. And let me share with you some details concerning the history of the implementation of inflation targeting in Paraguay. First, for us, it was absolutely essential that in the year 2003, the IMF, which is heavily criticized here, there, and everywhere, I don't criticize the IMF because they have hired my services, the IMF signed an agreement with Paraguay laying the groundwork for Paraguay to become a much more serious country, particularly in the field of sound macroeconomic foundations. So we signed an agreement with the IMF in the year 2003, and we started to create the new Paraguay, as we call it, a wholly new country. In the year 2003, before signing the agreements, wages and salaries were paid on day number 10 after, and pensions 45 days after deadline. And of course, we changed this scenario after 2003. In 2004, we started um, conducting different strategies to adopt the inflation targeting bridging. Even though our inflation was not that high, we used to have a high fiscal deficit, not as high as in other countries, but we started to think about implementing inflation targeting. Something very important to us Paraguayans, we were coming from a time of controlling monetary aggregates, and thanks to technology, ATM, financial deepening, credit cards, etc., the correlation between inflation and monetary aggregate growth 
was becoming diluted. So it made no sense for us to uh, keep on uh, remaining in the same scenario as regards monetary aggregate. Aggregates. If you ask me what is the monetary aggregate growth right now, my answer is I don't have the faintest idea. We are focusing on the interest rate right now. Finally, in May 2011, the Central Bank Board announced the implementation of this inflation targeting scheme. And there, I would like to talk about these five Cs that are the C, five C for the implementation of inflation targeting in Paraguay. Five letters C. <clears throat> I, we thought it was very important, since you are in this process of consolidating this new inflation targeting scheme, it's important to consider these six C's in, in Spanish. C for complex. It's not an easy decision. It's a decision that is not going to find a paved way. On the contrary, there will be problems and difficulties. And in the Paraguayan case, one of the difficulties was how are we going to move from a comfort zone? Paraguay has never had reasonably well-functioning. Uh, we had this monetary aggregate system, so how could we change something that was working? We had to explain it very clearly. We had to explain why we were changing our monetary policy scheme when aggregates were working. We had a very hard work to do. It wasn't easy. Look at how inflation rate worked throughout the time when monetary aggregates were the most relevant for the Central Bank of Paraguay, and it worked quite well. We had to work very hard. There will be some difficulties. This morning they were asking me what happens if Argentina finally doesn't. Well, it's not easy. I ref referred to the Central Bank of Chile. Nobody can say that their inflation target is not successful. But if you have a look at their beginning with implementation of inflation targets, they started from a lower level. They started with a much higher than we did. And they, in Chile, had some deviations from their target. However, they did not become non-credible. Credibility is not just provided by being able to comply with a target in a given year. This has to do with persistence. It's not a 100-meter race, but rather a long one. And it's not easy every year to comply with the targets you may have. But credibility is built throughout a long time. It's complex also because economic cycles may be determining. We were fortunate that we implemented inflation targets at the time when we had favorable external conditions. The dollar was reasonably valued, and commodity prices had reached their peak, so exchange rate was not a headache for us. The second C refers to inflation control. It's very important. We sometimes discuss the URE and the FACTO, but it's very important for it to be part of, of the central bank's regulations. It has to be made very clear. Not only do we have it in the central bank or charter, but also in our constitution, we know which the central bank's objective should be. And the priority is price stability. It doesn't mean that we do not look at what's happening with the product dynamics, but we only start looking at that once we are fine in terms of inflation. <clears throat> the third C implies C in Spanish, building or constructing capacities. Not always are all conditions given, the conditions indicated by literature to implement an inflation targeting scheme. 
If you look at the conditions in the various papers about what we should have before we are able to implement an inflation targeting scheme, we would never do it. We would still be discussing it in Paraguay. This is a learning by doing process. You learn as you do, as you are seated and start how to learning how to drive that new car, that new monetary policy. Building capacities, this consists in building the technical skills as well as the institutional capacities, insisting on human capital training. And what was of the essence for us was to have the support of many central banks in the region that had already made some progress. We were sure that we didn't need to reinvent the wheel when the wheel was there. We asked the various central banks around in order to implement, successfully implement our inflation targeting scheme. You need to start to start by the basics. We started with the basics in terms of models and then we deepened that. Of course, this goes hand in hand with the construction of institutions. You need to build institutions that will help you have a better monetary policy transmission. <laughs> Building capacities is something you are doing, something similar. We started with a target of 5 plus minus 2.5 in 2014, we lowered that to plus minus 2. Then we reduced the target to 4.5, and now it's 4. 4 is our inflation targeting target now. I always talk about 4% inflation target, and we use the band when we need it, plus minus 2%. Communication, that is fundamental. We need to be very clear when talking to the market as to what we are doing and why and what we are not doing and why. We are relatively aggressive in the good sense of the word. We have a lot of information to offer the market, especially when we are going to move in terms of increasing or reducing. So we need to have the, the public ready prepared so that the public is not taken by surprise by our movements. What was very important for us was to explain the exchange rate role. It's sometimes very difficult for us. We are a small economy, a small open economy. The exchange rate is the main reference. If you ask people how, how much is that the exchange rate, and people know. If you ask them about the last inflation, they don't know. So inflation rates, sorry, exchange rates remain an important element. And you need to be very clear as to the exchange rate policy, because otherwise importers or exporters will call you for you to do something. And that ends up damaging the central bank credibility in the implementation of inflation targets. Although we took a good uh, business cycle, then when there was a Guarani appreciation vis-a-vis -vis the US dollar, they said, you are fine because there is appreciation, and that helped control inflation. And that is why we say it's a floating ex free floating exchange rate. And we said no. And they saw it in 2015 when conditions changed. And we had a drop in the soybean price of 40%. This was accompanied by a relative price um, adjustment, and there was an appreci appreciation of the Guarani of 25 to 28%. So we need to explain what is going to be the role of the exchange rate when we, ex when in we implement inflation targets. <coughs> and the last and very important, Carlos has mentioned this already, coordination between fiscal policy and monetary policy. I've always said this. I say something very similar to what is said there. The Minister of Finance may be my best friend or my worst enemy in terms of inflation control. We do not need to go 
to the monetization of all fiscal deficits. You do not need to go out for an asado and a beer every weekend, although that helps. But the fact of having an undisciplined fiscal authority will make the monetary policy impossible or very costly in terms of how much we need to raise the rates. And that has a significant impact on society. So here you need coordination, strict coordination between fiscal and monetary policies. And it's not easy to achieve this kind of coordination. I have to say that fortunately in Paraguay, we have asados and we drink beer and they help me with this policy. We have something here that may not be relevant for Argentina, but I still wanted to mention it. Sometimes the central bank may raise their rates. If you know that most bonds are issued domestically and tied to the central bank reference rate or benchmark rate, the interest rate cost for the, author the, for the, the budget may vary high, and that may put some doubt as to the default risk of the authorities. That happened in Brazil with Lula, and recently, somehow, the function of the central bank was limited because there was some fiscal dominance in the sense that the true capacity of the central bank was restricted, and that damaged or affected fighting inflation. As you have treasury bills here and issuance is done abroad, this is not so relevant for Argentina, but this is something that may happen if you have fiscal authorities who are very highly indebted and when interest uh, rates are high. In Paraguay, we did not have high fiscal def uh, imbalances and we didn't have hyperinflation periods recently. And the public sector debt reached almost 60% of GDP, which was relatively low for Latin American standards. So we've been very good friends with people in the Ministry of Finance. With this, growth has been moderated. The growth of monetary aggregates when we were using this instrument to control inflation. But something important here, one of the few periods when there was a fiscal mismatch or imbalance was in the 1980s. More than uh, the government, it was government companies that started making extraordinary investments with a fixed exchange rate. They had a, the exchange rate was subsidized. The fixed exchange rate was very low as compared to the market exchange rate. And this is the only period where we had fiscal imbalances. It was a very bad period in terms of inflation as well as in terms of growth. So we should not go to the extremes of huge fiscal deficits so as to have an impact on growth and inflation. Sometimes just 4.5% deficit may be enough to generate undesired imbalances. An instrument that we have is fiscal responsibility law. This is a law that was passed in 2013, and basically it says that the maximum deficit by the central government is 1.5% of GDP. 1.5% of GDP, that's the maximum. In addition to this, it's important to point out how the issuance of bonds uh, takes place in Paraguay. Bonds can only be issued for two reasons in Paraguay. One is for debt and the other for capital expense, the chair. It's fundamental 
this characteristic of Paraguayan bonds is very important because you can never issue bonds to finance current uh, expenses and that makes life easier to central bank and uh, enables the macroeconomic stability of the country. We have final comments now. In Paraguay, the nominal stability history is not only the result of our monetary policy, but also the fiscal policy during all these years. We have improved our stability recently with the implementation of inflation targets, which have become an important step to consolidate this stability. And it's still helping me lower inflation. We started by five, now we are at four, and it also helps in downward convergence. It's amazing to see how uh, an inflation targeting scheme may contribute to this. An inappropriate management of fiscal affairs makes it very difficult. We know that it takes two to tango, so we need to tango between two in order to have good results. And I do not want to forget that I hope will be part of history for Latin American economies. Financial stability is fundamental, and it's a topic that we are going to discuss tomorrow. Many of the countries we have had in our countries, for instance, in Paraguay in the 1990s, uh, the problem has a lot to do with financial stab instability. So financial, monetary, and fiscal stability are all three very important. And not always will you get all of the conditions that you need in order to Im successfully implement an inflation targeting scheme. It's very difficult to have them all as the initial condition. The case of Paraguay has shown that these five or these five C's that I've just presented have been very valuable in the process in the implementation process. And now I'm not going to give you an additional C, but a J in Spanish in terms of inflation targeting implementation. This is not an advertising. Just just do it. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank my thanks to the Central Bank of Argentina, to Federico, for this invitation. I don't know if what I'm going to tell you will be very useful because we are living under unprecedented conditions in all countries. We have had two very uh, bad decades where everything was nationalized in the 1970s and in 1980s, extreme populism with an, an inflation of 7,000% up until 1985, gradual inflation, and then, of course, these inflationary scenarios here, there, and everywhere. The quick adjustment to this scenario was much easier from the political standpoint because those who won the election said sudden adjustment vis-a-vis -vis Vargas Llosa, a bad candidate, talking about adjustment that had to be made. Vargas uh, Llosa said, I'm going to raise uh, the price of gasoline by 1,000 percent. And even Alan Garcia funded an electoral campaign, very much like Finn Floyd in the wall with that big mouth and leaving the, eating everything and leaving the country as if it were a moor cold and barren. Therefore, we had some sort of margin for improvement, 3,300% gas, 800% hike in different essential elements and foodstuffs 15 times as expensive as they were. This was done together with the Venezuelan government and many things connected with people making demonstrations. 
we had monetary anchors, anchors that were flexible. We have, eight years ago, the governor of the Canadian bank uh, said, well, we have not abandoned monetary anchors. Monetary anchors have abandoned us. But we didn't want to tie ourselves to a predictable fixed uh, rate of exchange. Uh, I mean, uh, a sort of pegged exchange rate. And we were not sure if a central bank could uh, survive without financing fiscal deficit. The overall scenario was absurd. In 1990 and 92, I was working at the central bank, very much like uh, Lucas here present as thing as he is now. I used to be as thing then, back then. Reserves were negative. Cash flow was zero and uh, the government had to face demonstrations by the end of each month when these uh, uh, rate hikes were announced and it was a very confusing situation and the government could then reimburse the money and in Peru over 27 years we could not refinance these governmental activities many people wanted to monetize Carlos Rodriguez Guillermo Calvo insisted on the fact of dollarizing the economy and they were on the verge of persuading president President Fujimori, because of course they were economists and that they were maths experts. They were about to persuade President Fujimori back then to take those measures. Sachs and Dornbush were then saying, who is going to advise European, Eastern, Eastern European countries? And of course, this has to do with the fact that they had to tell the president two countries are dollarized. Panama, the president is in jail. And the other one is Liberia, where the president was killed last week. Well, of course, when Fujimori listened to these two pieces of news, he said, well, we'll better wait and see. So adjustment was uh, the measure that was put in place at the time, growth rates, monetary growth rates, where in place back then, and the market had shrunk because of inflation and uh, the dollar base, more than 90 percent in the economy, was connected with the minimum reserve requirements and uh, foreign exchange transactions. So we tried to purchase reserves. The rate of exchange in Peru was a floating rate of exchange, wholly different from many other Latin American countries. In 1990, we had the first country to have a floating rate of exchange, Mexico after the tequila crisis, and Chile, Colombia, after the Russian crisis, 2009, Brazil only with Arminio Fraga. But when you make a strong adjustment, you need prices to caliber. And the price that we took for that purpose was much higher than the market price. So we had to purchase a big amount of reserves to monetize, because balances had also shrunk, and the rate of exchange had to go nearer this uh, scenario. So we tried to make use of minimum reserve requirements to exercise control over credit growth. Monetary aggregates were controlled and strengthened after the announcements concerning different ranges ever since 1994. In 1994, 39% inflation in the times of Alan Garcia uh, was not controlled by the government. There were two private institutions publishing daily inflation because inflation was very high indeed. In 1993, inflation was 39% uh, when we started announcing the inflation targeting regime. Inflation dropped 
dropped from uh, to 15, then to 10%. In 1996, it increased because in 1995 there were re-elections and the Peruvian constitution was changed a little bit before the Menem's uh, changing of the constitution in Argentina. Um, well, then we had Chavez, Evo Morales, Correa, and the whole story. Fiscal spending was very high and a war conflicts was then in place. All these measures were populist. And uh, perhaps if this scenario was not so, the drop was even much quicker. And uh, between 1986 and 2001, the inflation rate became a negative rate. And there, we decided to adopt inflation targeting to try to have an expansionary monetary policy, uh, unlike Carlos Fernández Valdovino's scenario. Japan did so three years ago in a very different scenario, stemming from negative inflation in order to put in place inflation targets. So there were many countries that implemented this measure before. And then uh, we have wide monetary aggregates, flexible. We saw how credit was growing, the interest rate. Uh, and in, between 2001 and 2002, there was uh, a narrow scenario with the central bank deposits, uh, commercial paper, short-term bonds, and then we have an interest rate corridor and later on controlled interest rate scenario. And ever since 2003, we use open market transactions to maintain that interest rate at the level that we effectively have today. So as you can see, our interest rate has been moving very actively in 2008 when all commodities prices increased and inflation also increased. Our inflation was on average 7, 5% like Panama, Salvador and Ecuador, Chile, 10%. The year after the crisis, we kept on moving, and this year, 0.75%. And despite the fact that we are dollarized, everything has been working very well because of different features of Peru. We are the first country with inflation targeting in a dollarized-based country. So. In 1994, in order to stabilize and sterilize the uh, certificates of deposits, was uh, the basis for us to engage in repo transactions. And we use the central bank securities. And then in 2001, we created deposit facilities for corporate bonds in order to improve uh, the way in which we controlled short-term interest rate. In 2002, we created indexed CDs according to the rate of exchange to have a specific instrument to intervene in the um, foreign exchange market when pressures, of course, were generated in the forward market. Then we introduced uh, uh, rate of exchange deposits and we tried to uh, have uh, a downsized scenario. We still have a lot of dollar denominated loans, even though at the beginning of this century and during the last century, 81% was the rate. And, uh, Today is 29%. In the Peruvian financial system, there are still many uh, foreign banks lending money to uh, private firms. There are six foreign banks having a portfolio over $1 billion, and four or five have a lesser amount. On the other hand, over the last years, 
even though between 2013 and 2016 there has been a massive issuance of bonds in the New York market, uh, we have to say that issuance has increased this year, denominated in soles. And uh, as Federico said, the inflation was 5%. Now it is under 3%. And our target is 2 uh, plus minus uh, 2. So it's between 2 and 3, as you can see. So this total inflation has to do with the weight of foodstuffs. Together with Philippines and Russia, we are the country have a more weight concerning uh, foodstuffs, two points under. And this makes the whole scenario much more volatile. And concerning inflation, there are uh, very good anchors in place. And uh, uh, anchoring expectations have allowed us to deal with the negative supply shock, shocks that, uh, of course, were easily reversed. Inflation in 2008 uh, rising by 7 percent, while today, so uh, even in 2009, it was only 2 percent. And today, our inflation has been a little bit higher because of El Nino tide and current effects. And now we have negative inflation. Inflation has disappeared. Last month, uh, because of uh, supply shock, we have had uh, shock, uh, the lemonade uh, inflation, we call it, because the price of water uh, rose. Uh, but then the whole scenario is easily reversed. And we do not generally react vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis these supply shocks. And sometimes we are um, uh, d trying to reduce rates much more slowly in Mexico. There is a clear-cut case concerning the exchange rate. In Colombia, they had to raise the interest rate in times of recession because the pass-through is, of course, affecting inflation and inflationary expectations. And I should tell you that our inflation target is the lowest in the region, 2.5 plus, minus, minus, plus. Now we are minus 2.1 because uh, our stance position has been opportunistic after the commodity shocks. But we wanted to have an inflation that would be much similar to the U.S. inflation. Because it's very easy to have dollar-denominated deposits in Peru. Our Peruvian constitution after Anangancia, the seizure of foreign deposits. Now we have a law passed in Congress say that any Peruvian may hold deposits in any currency. And therefore, low inflation, highly competitive with the U.S. inflation. Up until the year 2007, we were unable to do so, of course. But now the whole thing is different. Low inflation has also allowed us to uh, draw uh, local currency denominated curve, a long curve with uh, short-term rates, 30 to 40 years, uh, with a marked increase in the liquidity of domestic bonds and an improvement in the composition of uh, our debt, 4.8 percent for uh, uh, the different bonds. So you have the 10-year bond, 20-year bond, and 30-year bonds having rates ranging from 5, 6, or 8 percent. And then after the Lehman Brothers crisis, and now according to Standard and Poor's, we have uh, uh, this uh, foreign debt and an improvement in the yield curve. Uh, this curve, as you can see, uh, has been drawn as if it were a plateau. Values are low. These are uh, soles-denominated rates. 
And then we have an inflation targeting scheme whereby we can recognize the problems caused by dollarization. The underlying idea is to create confidence in the local currencies, Sol 863, and the new Sol, we uh, took away nine zeros out of the local currency, nine zeros. Can you believe that? Well, unbelievable. This is a competition no one wants to win. And we have also taken a sort of precautionary and preventive stance vis-a-vis -vis international reserves. Maybe we have the higher output rate in the region. And we intervene in the market to try to offset this effect on the balance sheet. Having a dollar-denominated credit when there is a recession or devaluation is the same that happened in the US with the mortgage, the subprime mortgage crisis. When, of course, uh, there was a collapse in uh, these mortgage bonds. Uh, there was a major drop in uh, foreign currencies, and this is what we call the uh, Fisher's deflation. Fisher's deflation, and this is a problem, a problem very difficult to reverse. It limits the ability of any central bank to act as lender of last resort. It increases the risk of default in the banking sector associated to rate of exchange mismatches, and it reduces the effectiveness of standard or conventional monetary policy. And we have used many instruments in this regard, reserve requirements higher in dollars, uh, as you can see there, 42. And reserve requirements have uh, has helped us moderate credit because credit was uh, growing very quickly indeed. We have used reserve requirements to attain many more objectives and goals because in our case, banking supervision is outside of the sphere of the central bank. It is in the hands of the bank superintendency. And the problem that they have is the solvency and credit worthiness of banks. It doesn't matter if there is a strong depreciation. It doesn't matter what happens with a person who has to pay a mortgage in dollars. There's a drop in demand. But if the bank is still solvent, they don't care about that. We have engaged in provisioning measures, and they have done something concerning loan to value for dollar denominated loans, mortgage loans, and the overall macroprudential concern for central banks, because the superintendency of banks, if they believe that banks are still solvent, even though they may have losses, for them, banks are still credit worthy. And after the year 2013, we set limits on dollar-denominated loans if they do not reduce uh, their position and uh, increase uh, minimum reserve requirements. Otherwise, we won't have uh, many more tools to put in place. We try to moderate credit by means of these instruments, Brazil for car loans, Mexico for mortgage loans, Colombia for global credit in 2009-2010 with similar measures. Reserves are quite high for the reasons we have just explained. We have intervened in the exchange market. We have sold but also purchased when they have strong uh, pressures. The exchange rate moves after the depreciation, 40 percent, then it appreciated by 8 percent. Managed float. It's a case of managed float. Even there is a recent Frankel's article talking about Asia and how it was better for some countries that had this floating. There is a discussion that is still open, and this responds to some specific conditions. <clears throat> this is a case of strong dollarization. This 
An important point is to know how to react swiftly and try to be prudent. The dream of every central banker is not to be visible. As old monetarists used to say, being the liver or the pancreas, nobody's thinking of their pancreas unless there is a problem. Or it has to be something very weird. Who would be thinking about his pancreas if everything is fine? In 2008, we reduced reserve requirements. There was a growth of credit in the fourth quarter. Then it contracted by demand, and we introduced one-year repos before the Fed and the ECB. And the same thing has happened after the tapering. In general, this is 2008. This remained like better than other countries, as you can see on the right side. And output grew more than other countries in the region. You can see the red line. And access to credit was relatively high. Dollarization of credit reached 82. Now it's 29. It's still high if you consider foreign banks that are not affected by our measures and the capital markets. Still, we are, we are aware of this. And we have tried to limit when, when it's more than 10 million in three years, at some point we thought of uh, excluding that 10 million so that the, bigger, the biggest ones should know how to hedge. Typically, the, it's not under 40 billion, but that goes up. It's going to, to lend. Less than 10 would be complicated. Inflation, we adopted inflation targets. The average has been the, the lowest in the region based on high growth. Despite the fact that many people say that fighting inflation will go against growth, this actually tends to accompany growth. Of course, it may be a process, it's not immediate, but you can get a one digit inflation in a short period from the moment we adopted inflation target till we had one digit, it was three years and three months, despite all problems. Well, that is the end. I only have 24 seconds left. Thank you very much. I want to thank you, all three of you. We are running out of time, so we are going to take one round of questions, one minute each to answer. My question would be a bridge on all the gaps in the discussion about inflation and expectations. Kagan, chronic, structuralist inflation, there are always expectations, and they are a key element in inflation and disinflation. In your crisis, in your opinion, how fast should a central bank uh, react? For instance, we have our expectations exceeding our targets. What do you think about that in your experience, in the regional experience? Don't answer now. We're going to take a, a couple more questions. He needs to use the mic for us to translate. No. They have mentioned the relationship between fiscal and inflation. In Argentina, the central bank has a target. It won't transfer the treasury any more than a given nominal amount in pesos to monetize the deficit. In that sense, if there is still a fiscal deficit, what would be the transmission mechanism to inflation? Because the central bank would not be monetizing that deficit. And the second question for Julio. Dr. Velarde, sorry, you mentioned the difficulty in the role of being the lender of last resort with a dollarized financial system. Is there any evidence that that dollarization generated more prudence on the part of the financial system saying, since we don't have a central bank as a lender of last resort, was there more prudence in the banking system? I wanted to ask to all three countries, Paraguay, Peru, and Latin America, 
What experience do you have in terms of indebtedness in short-term central bank bills? What has been your experience regarding the magnitude and structure of the short-term bill indebtedness? Bill indebtedness? Question to Dr. Fernandez Valdovinos. In Paraguay, in the last period, we saw several adjustments in the inflation target. One was very recent in February this year. Did you see that inflation targets responded? Were they adjusted to the lowering center of the target? And if the drop in the interest rate in Paraguay short ago, was it a response to a more anchored inflation target to a lower level, or rather was it because of deceleration of economic activity because of weather conditions this year? Well, that's all the questions we will take. Would you please choose what to answer? Expectations. Much is communication. Ten seconds. This inflation, which was quite high last month, so we, in the communication, we would never say inflation without water and lemon was 0 0.07. We did that because we wanted expectations to be anchored. We expected this to be temporary. It sounds ridiculous, but it helps. In our case, fiscal was zero. The law does not allow us to do this directly with the government, and we can only buy bonds up to 5% of the monetary base. It's limited, and we haven't. The dollar reserve requirement is there to guarantee that if there should be a, a run in dollars, banks will have enough dollars to protect themselves. Banks are banks. Watch out. In 97 and 98, dollar credits were financed by short-term lines. And at that point, we were coming out of populism. We believed in the market. In the first half of 98, more than half the credit enlargement was financed by short-term credit. But then, after that, we started to have reserve requirements for short-term credits that exceeded a given amount. And then you learn, after some extreme populism, some interventionism, we became very liberal. It's not bad. You need to evaluate risks at all times. And then the short-term debt has not caused problems. We have issued a lot of papers to sterilize. In this case, when we intervened, selling dollars, almost the uh, papers have almost disappeared. And if we do not continue to buy, then those papers start dying on their own. There's been no problem with that. In Chile, they have papers from back 1981, from the banking crisis back then, and they still don't have any problems with that. Expectations, I agree with Julio. Much is communication and credibility built throughout time. The experience that we have as regards lowering rates is that expectations were adjusted rapidly, and within two months, they were all within the new inflation targets and expectations for our monetary policy. How did we adjust? Well, as mentioned before, we did it slowly, despacito. When we were very confident that we were going to get it, we adjusted our inflation target downwards. And ad hoc rule we had is how much has been average inflation in the past five years. We saw that in the past five years, average inflation was 4.5. We dropped it. We had new data. Then it was 4, and then we lowered it to 4. And when we were very comfortable, we decided to reduce our target. And in terms of what happened with the interest rate, Federico will help me. I will take Federico to the Central Bank of Paraguay because he knows a lot about it. Much was due 
to the inflation, which is anchored at 3 point something percent, and a slow, a small deceleration that may not look as a deceleration outside did cause some problems domestically. So it is a deceleration internally, almost a failure for some. But it was basically to try and provide some boost. Once we had expectations and projections anchored, only then did we reduce the, the rate. Reducing, one of the discussions we have now is not only what is the potential result for the Paraguayan economy, but what's the neutral interest rate, because it looks much lower than it used to be. Another question related to the fiscal authorities, the transfer limit is zero, the same as in Peru. I emphasized that it is very costly when there is no monetary policy that will take you to the inflation levels that we all want and deserve. So there is some work to be done to reduce that. Of course, I like strawberry ice cream, others like chocolate ice cream. I will let you choose the speed with, at which they will converge towards that ideal situation where the central bank doesn't have to monetize any type of deficit. As to the central bank debt, is that's not a problem for us. Many people talk about quasi-fiscal deficits because the interest rate that we pay is a bit higher than what we receive for the reserves. And I always give the example of what happened in 2015. Basically, there, there was a depreciation of 25%. So in one year, we our profit was four or five years of the cost of interest. If you see the amount, it's a lot more, actually. I'm not proposing a devaluation to cover central bank losses, but sometimes we need to bear in mind that we may have a sudden profit because of our accumulated reserves. I agree with what has been said. As regards expectations, I believe we have to be tough because it's a fiscal game that is being played. I'm not thinking about any specific situation, but this is a frequent game chicken and egg game where the monetary authority and the fiscal authority are at play. I would uh, propose, if I were a central banker, I would uh, advocate for an inflation target and not change it at the first change at the first change in the fiscal deficit because i believe that that makes the central bank lose credibility. And I think that is what has happened in the case of Uruguay, where despite a fiscal situation, which is not ideal, with a 4% deficit that is high for Uruguay, the central bank has remained very firm in its inflation target. And this has proven to be the right thing to do. And the fiscal authority has been the one that felt forced to perform a fiscal adjustment in order to be in compliance with fiscal targets. As a central banker, I would 
be stricter. And as regards debt, the Paraguayan experience was, as Carlos said, but in general, we have studied many cases, in particular in capital inflow episodes where central banks have purchased reserves that they need to sterilize then. In general, there are exceptions, but this has led to quasi-fiscal deficits that have turned this instrument into an instrument that needs to be used during a period, during a short period. To conclude, I think it's very interesting to analyze the experience of Peru, as mentioned by Julio. <coughs> This is something that I'd like to see details about. It is not obvious how you deal with inflation targets in a dollarized economy. That is a very important topic to think about. Tras la exposición, la conquista de la inflación, damos por finalizado este primer encuentro de las jornadas monetarias y bancarias del Banco Central.